Welcome, everyone, to the L7C Podcast NBA Playoff Edition. Today, we are talking NBA playoffs, reviewing the first round and previewing the second round. And we have our basketball expert, Evan Debo, with us. How are you doing today, sir? Good, Martin. How are you doing, man? I am doing well. I've been watching every game my body allows me to because, you know, we're on the East Coast. So those 10, 30 games are stretches. But if they're do or die games, I am up the whole way. But I have been enjoying being able to watch good basketball every day of the week, basically. Love it. It's been rough trying to stay out for those West Coast ones, for sure. Man. Which. Thank God for ABC Sundays where they can be put at 3.30 in the afternoon. Love it. Love it. Love it. So today we're going to be reviewing the first round. We're going to see how good me and Evan did with some of our picks there. Then we're going to be previewing the second round where two games have already been underway. And two more will be two days. So Evan, first off, before we start going individual series in the first round, did you find the first round enjoyable this year? Uh, yeah, I def I definitely did. Even the series that were, um, you know, blowout or blowouts by all extent. So either a sweep or a, a four one setting, I, I learned a lot about where each team was, which was really enjoyable. Um, so, I mean, the, we'll touch base on the bucks here in a second, but I mean, just seeing, you know, what they were able to do and dismantling the heat as opposed to them getting dismantled a year ago. I mean, you, I loved watching those matchups. I love seeing the amount of three point shooting that they had um, uh, come through and just how they were able to uh, really, really um, make Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo work for it. Um, And they, they struggled in that series a lot just with, with uh, how Milwaukee had upgraded um, not just Drew holiday, but again, the, the, the shooting and um, you know, adding in Bobby Portis and some of those guys. I mean, I, you can say that for all of these series for me. I, I found it enjoyable. I was that kind of same thing where I, again, I learned a lot about strengths and deficiencies of the teams that advance and, you know, what the teams that lost, um, you know, need in order to progress into, uh, you know, the next stage in their development to try to win an NBA title, what pieces they might need and, and what have you. And um, yeah, it was great. Oh, I agree. I agree. But since you brought up the bugs, let's, Actually, let's make that be the first series we actually review because on our previous one, our previews, both you and I said this one could go the distance. We thought this could go seven. We both said seven. We both picked the Bucks. We were both right. The Bucks did advance, but it did not go seven like you said. They clean swept them, which, to be honest, this was one of the shockers in the first round for me because I did not see a sweep coming in this. Did you? No, outside of, yeah, I mean, we thought this was going to be, I mean, just based on last year, we thought this was going to be a struggle for Milwaukee, but they ended up pulling it out. But I mean, with the exception of, um, you know, game one where uh, Duncan Robinson just lit up from three to start and then, you know, Milwaukee with that game winner in overtime, with the exception of that, every single game was a blowout. Um, It was a blowout, but it was a blowout. It was a blowout. I think the minimum score difference in all these games uh, was the last one, which was 17. Milwaukee won by at least 17 in the other three games. So, I mean, it was, again, um, I, I touched base, I think, on on a lot of the the things that they added, the three-point shooting, you name it. I mean, it was uh, Brent, Brent Forms was phenomenal coming off the bench. He and Bobby Portis are just lethal from three. Um, that was a struggle for Miami. Bam really struggled. Um uh, you know, I, I, I don't even think Giannis had that great of a series. If is as crazy as that is to say, I mean, he averaged 23 and a half, 15 and almost, uh, 15 rebounds, which is insane and, uh, assists, but he wasn't all that efficient as he could have been. He still did the honest thing where he settles and you're like, dude, why are you still taking three pointers? I like, don't do that. You're hurting your team and hurting possessions. And then obviously the foul line struggles. And then, you know, what everybody's been clamoring for all season of, this dude's taking more than 10 seconds at the line. They finally called it. Um, so, I mean, with all that being said, I mean, they, they were so impressive, man. They could switch, you name it, just the length. Uh, as we mentioned, too, they were, um, they were utilizing uh, Brooke Lopez a lot, and, and he was phenomenal uh, in the paint. Uh, again, he's progressively been going from, you know, Splash Mountain uh, out behind the, the arc in working into closer and closer shots and really taking advantage of the size, whereas the league's kind of really spaced out. He's like, Oh yeah, I'm kind of like seven, two. So, 
and a big physical presence. So, I mean, they were just fantastic all the way around. Kudos to the, to the bucks who um, really laid the, laid the wood to Miami in this series. And, you know, Miami for them, they, I mean, they had some struggles throughout the year and everybody thought they'd be able to just kind of flip the switch and turn it on. Um, and, and they didn't, I think you saw that, you know, they really miss not having, you know, a, a guy like, uh, Jay Crowder is another guy who can, who can kind of switch defensively and take up fouls and, uh, things of that nature. Tyler hero, he did not wasn't good. bubble Tyler hero by any means. Um, you know, again, it's just kudos to, to Milwaukee. They knew what they needed to do to get over the hurdle. They addressed that in the off season and with some, some trades and stuff like that. And, um, and that's the result of very surprising, as both of us said, 4-0 sweep. I think what you said on the last podcast was very, like, telling about Milwaukee. Like, when you said about how they improved their bench, like, you have a guy like P.J. Tucker coming off the bench, and then someone who actually got some run time because DiVincenzo got hurt, Jeff Teague. And for people who remember the old Atlanta Hawk days or, like, things like that, Jeff Teague can play. And so him... Just seeing him, it was the game four that I saw him make some shots. And I was just like, wow, you were really caught it on their bench over there. And then Miami, which I guess almost the same thing I'll say with L.A. I don't want to blame the shortened like, rest that they got, but they did only get 72 days rest off season wise. So we don't know like the tolls that that had on their bodies from finals, 72 break, 72 day break, and then back into the season. But. They were not the same Miami Heat team that they were in the bubble. And obviously they got Victor Bondivo, but he didn't play. But where do you think where do you think Miami goes from here in the offseason to get back into Eastern Conference Finals contention? I think for for Miami, they really need, I think, uh I mean, like every team can use one of these. So it's it seems trivial to say they need a play making, they need a play making wing. Um, but I think they, I really think they do. I mean, Jimmy's very slow things up, you know, get people set in a half court offense, but in terms of pushing the ball and setting up your teammates, you know, you've got Dragic who's getting up there in age and that's, that's really it. Um, you've got, of course, I mean, just an army of shooters and Ariza and Robinson and, and, uh, hero. And even, I mean, shout out for Pat Riley, you know, snagging Dwayne Deadman off the bit, off the, uh, the scrap heat too. That guy was provided some really good minutes and he can step out and you got Kendrick Nunn too, more of a Kendrick Nunn's more of kind of a, you know, by all accounts, kind of a Colin Sexton type um, guard that, you know, you want to put in that point guard mold that he's just more of a score um, uh, and just how more of a slashing two guard as opposed to a, a shooting distributing one. Um, so I think they need, they could use probably another, um, just another wing playmaker, I think. Again, I mean, uh, that's not Trevor Reza. That's not Duncan Robinson. Um, again, they've got size. Andre Godala, you know, he paid to play 26 minutes in the um, finale. But, I mean, they knew that when they acquired him last year that it was kind of on borrowed time as a guy who's definitely on the latter part of his career. He's not going to be the Andre Godala of old by any means. But, I mean, again, they had, um, you know, I really like the pressure Sachiwa pick this past year and he'll continue to develop, but uh, that's, that's where I think they can, they can use. And again, just another year under um, hero's belt um, and, and Robinson's belt and, um, and out bio's belt, some of those guys and, and they'll be right. They'll be right back in there. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And they get to go home and Milwaukee gets to move on and we'll talk about their second round matchup in a little bit. There is another series in the East that me and you were completely wrong about. And that was the Atlanta Hawks. And our, we're going to adopt them, our New York Knicks. Uh, we, we both wanted the Knicks to come out of this. But like we said on the previous podcast, if you guys haven't watched basketball and you got to see Trey Young for the first time on national TV, NBA world, basketball world, meet Trey Young. He told us not going to happen. And Atlanta won this in five and really could have won this in four. What did you think about the young Atlanta team and Trey Young? and? Um, most improved player Julius Randle really struggled in this series, and it was almost like the old Chicago Bulls teams, where it was Thibodeau and Derrick Rose doing everything, and then no one else did anything. What do you think about that series? Um, there are a lot of things there. Again, I can't understate. I think, I mean, ninety percent of why I was so excited about 
the Knicks were again just the fan base. I mean, one of the best fan bases in all of sports. And when they're loud, they let you hear it. They let Trey hear it about his his hairline. They um, let him hear it uh, with a four letter word attached to his name and a chant. Like it just again, I can't. I said it before. I'll say it again. New York Knicks basketball that's good is good for the league. Um, so that was that was really really great to see. But you're right. I mean, it was kind of. Let's remix the Chicago Bulls a little bit. And again, I mean, New York hadn't been to the playoffs in forever. So, I mean, I don't want to undermine the fact that they got bounced in the first round, what have you. I mean, R.J. Barrett, those guys have seen develop. Like we said, I mean, Julius Randle, I mean, really struggled. He still averaged 18 a game in the five-game series. But um, Guy just was horribly inefficient. I mean, some of his kind of herky-jerky, um, you know, fadeaway shots uh, inside 16 and – um, baseline stuff like that weren't falling, what have you. And, um, and Trey young just went out there and had himself a series. I mean, that was, that was really the difference. And I mean, I get, there's a lot of folks that probably myself included, that aren't, aren't big Trey young fans. I think to an extent, like I, like he's definitely kind of more, I think in how he approaches the game, he's definitely more kind of like, honestly, a James Harden than he is a Steph Curry to me. Um, Cause I mean, just the way he, he plays the officials and which is an aspect of the game. I mean, like just the, the foul drawing, the jumping backwards and in, um, into a, a trailing defender to get to the line, like as a tactic um, as opposed to just, you know, straight taking shots and making or missing. Like I get that that's a perspective, but I mean, this guy, this guy was unbelievable. Um, Bogdanovich was unbelievable. Um, and again, just more of, I mean, Clint Capella, Ooh, that guy, that guy was honestly, I mean, he just, he out round out rebounded every one of the New York Knicks. I mean, the Knicks really were hurting, keeping him off the boards that led to, to second uh, possessions by the Hawks. Um, you know, just to, again, just sling it from three as they've got, you know, Danilo Gallinari and all those guys, um, Trey on the series 29 and, and almost 10 assists. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, Atlanta was really, really, really good. Um, cannot be understated just the kind of job that Nate McMillan's done since taking over, um, for, uh, for Pierce. But, um, I mean, that's a veteran guy who's been in the trenches with, with Indiana and Portland and a couple other things. And I mean, they're one of the top teams of basketball record wise since Nate McMillan took over and, and we saw it on full display in that four, one series. Martin, what, what did you see in the series? Uh, besides Trey, my biggest thing was Julius because we also both said the way that the Knicks got to the playoffs and all of that, that he was like, he was definitely a top five, six MVP like candidate that we put down there, which still regular season, rightfully so. But when we got to this series, like the stats that I have on him is that he was shooting like 29% from the field. Like that's, that's not going to cut it. And like shooting 33% from three, he did shoot 85 from the line. But like you said, he still averaged 18, but it was a very inefficient 18 points per game. So that was one of those biggest things too, that I saw. And also how Trey Young, they they have a lot of shooters. And if people didn't like you already said, like Bobon, um Palinari, like obviously Lou Williams, one of our people, but like then they also have players who play like five. And Lou didn't even Lou didn't even play too too much either. I mean, in the finale, he only played six minutes and they did this, you know. Yeah, it's like Bob, then you already said quick uh, they're they are actually put together a team like when you actually look at the names and how they play and it just felt like they could do whatever they wanted and besides game three where Derrick Rose was the leading scorer with 30 every other game Trey Young was the leading scorer and Clint Capella was the leading rebounder so it's like if you have the leading scorer leading rebounder of the game and there's not really that much you can do and and like you said I don't want to crap on New York because they have not been in the playoffs in forever but I expected this series to go a little bit longer, six, seven. I did not expect it to go five with Trey Young taking a bow after the deep three. But man, Sky Sky could potentially be the limit for Atlanta if they can keep the pieces and keep improving. Yeah, I mean, and neither, I mean, even that, I mean, Trey wasn't all that efficient. He uh he played 41 minutes. I mean, but again, when you just kind of volume shoot like he does. Um, and get to the line as much as he does. I mean, he had of his uh, 36 in the closeout game, 13 of those came from the foul line. Again, just shows you how much, I mean, he plays efficient. I mean, it's very much, he was, he was actually horrendous shooting the ball. 
he was 10 of 28. I mean, that I was bad, but he took 38 or sorry, 38. So he was 10 of 28. Um, not 38. He was, that would have been really, really bad, but, uh, t- uh 10 to 28, which is only 35%. But I mean, he, he struggled shooting the ball, but again, the guy is so tactful in how he gets to the line. I mean, I see a lot of, um, they're longer and they play defense way better, but I see a lot of like 17, 18 rockets in this team. Good, good call. I do. I mean, and you've got, maybe I'm just making the comparison cause you got Capella and then you, you've just got kind of the, the ISO three point threat and just dis- distribution um, machine and uh, for the cops. But I mean, again, I mean, they've got guys who can just launch it, launch it, launch it. Um, Okongu had some good backup big minutes uh, in there too. Um, the rookie out of USC. Again, I would, I was kind of, kind of talk, trying to talk myself into if the Cavs ended up drafted him a year ago, cause he, he was in contention, but um, you name it from Solomon Hill to Kevin Herter, to um, even John Collins and, and Bogdan Bogdanovich. I mean, they just, they can light it up from wherever. I get a lot of Rockets vibes from this team, and this could be a team that, like, you know, gets maybe gets on a little bit of a roll here and can can advance to the, the finals, the Eastern finals. So, no, yeah, that's a good call on you comparing them to the, the 17 18 Rockets team. I think the only, obviously, coaching wise, Nate McMillan is a more defensive philosophy. Right? Yeah. And besides, then Tony, who is not a defensive-minded coach, but yeah, those two series we were we were a little bit off the mark. But let's go to some series that we actually were exactly on the mark. Uh, the Brooklyn Nets over the Boston Celtics, four-one. Uh, we both said that one game would be the max that Boston would get, and they did get that one on a fifty ball from Jason uh, Tatum. But this was this was pretty clear-cut, dry. Like watching. The three, Durant, Harden, Kyrie, Joe Harris, all of them play together. They they are an extremely dangerous team. Evan, what did you see in the Boston and Brooklyn series? And obviously, we have some stuff to talk about with Boston, so we'll throw that in there as well. But what did you see in that? Yeah, I mean, I just, going into this, I was really worried about Boston's depth. Um, you know, I think that, they, again, they just, they didn't have bodies and we knew that, you know, it was going to be kind of like we talked about with Steph Curry of it's just one guy and how far he can take him. I mean, Jason with his, if you include the play-in game, the second 50 piece, mm-hmm. um, you know, in six games, it was amazing. They were able to steal that, that one by six, um, uh, you know, against, against Brooklyn. But um, I mean, again, they just, they just didn't have the firepower and who does have the firepower. I mean, I think I said when this trade happened, many podcasts ago and I still hold that I think this is Brooklyn's year um again just even if you catch one on your bad night catch one of them on a bad night you still got the other two to contend with and I mean the way uh you know Blake Griffin's been playing lately and stuff too I mean Bruce Brown I mean it's just again it's just like almost inevitable it's just juggernaut type mentality but um, you know, for the Celtics again, Tatum, Tatum was phenomenal. The series had average 30 and a half, um, five boards and, and four assists. But, uh, I mean, again, it was, it was the big three, um, uh, in, in how they played it just, I mean, absolutely made it clear that, I mean, it just was two different, two different, way two different teams, um, way too many different teams or way, way two different teams. Like, didn't even deserve to be on the same court, which results in a five, one kind of thing. But I mean, for the Celtics, again, they just didn't have anybody to put the ball in the basket outside of that. I mean, when you're talking Fournier, you know, here and there, just on volume scoring, he'll get up there, but um, you know, Tristan Thompson, Romeo Langford's been such a disappointment. Um, you know, Marcus smart here and there, will give you some knee, Aaron knee, Smith, Grant Williams, Peyton Pritchard, Jabari Parker, like, I can't remember. This was a team, right? We said in the last podcast where I said up and down the roster, who's going to get you 12 points. That was them, them and the Clippers. Yeah. Both. Like, yeah. Who's going to get you, who do you feel confident is going to go out and get you 12 points? Like maybe Marcus smart outside of that. I don't know. And that, and that showed here. So, um, and then as they got defeated in game five, Boston went nuclear on a couple different thought, thoughts in their front office. So, um, I think it was time for Danny Ainge to step down, which he did is, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the czar of the, the basketball ops and GM department. 
um, for Boston. Again, I mean, it, I've been listening on the radio all week. People have been, you know, picking apart his coulda, shouldas. And, um, you know, famously, that's the thing with, with Ainge, right, is, hey, he almost did this. He almost did that. Yeah. Um, again, he's, I think the good outweighs the bad. He did get them the, the you know, the 08 title and assembled the kind of the first big three, um, you know, to put a stop to LeBron with, with Allen and Garnett and then getting all the, those guys around him, um, Eddie House and, um, and uh, you know, all those guys who just were able, Kendrick Perkins. Um, those were, those are some impressive teams. And then going, yeah, back to back against the Lakers, it was the eighties again. It was great because of Danny Mitch. And then even more recently too, I mean, to get, let's not undermine the fact that they have Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum on the roster because of him. And, you know, again, how the, how the Brooklyn Nets swap, you know, was handled and everything else. They got Jason Tatum out of that. Um, and they even swindled an extra pick out of Philadelphia to do it when they knew, Hey, Jason Tatum's way above everybody else to do that swap for to go from one to three and they still get their guy and they got another first out of it too, for, um, the Fultz deal. But, um, the, the more surprising one was, was Brad Stevens, who's, you know, still a relatively young coach, but I mean, he was there eight, seven, eight years, um, essentially kind of going into the front offices, like director of ops or something like that. And just kind of in a president of ops, um, mold. And now Boston's looking for a coach. I mean, I did not see that coming, Martin. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I think there were some people that were clamoring like, Hey, this is, you know, we might need to do this, but I didn't see that doesn't happen. I don't think if the organization isn't basically telling him to step back or we're going to fire you kind of thing. So, um, what, what are your thoughts? Did that shock you as much? Yeah, it did shock me. It shocked me that I don't know if I want to consider it a promotion or not, because it'll basically be the new Danny Ainge. Well, it's, it's not a promotion. But it's like, I, I don't know. I wasn't expecting him to not be the coach next year. I thought with this year and also with Jalen Brown being down, I don't think they would have beat uh, the Nets with Jalen Brown. But I just felt like I was like, OK, so now they're looking for a new coach. And like, who's out there? Who are they going to? Higher. I mean, living out here in Ohio, there were some rumblings with the, his connection to Holtman, and I was, and I don't think that's ever going to happen. So it's like, who do you hire that can connect with Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown? And we're also in this new era where you can't do anything unless you run it by your star player. So who does Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown want as their coach? Like, I don't know who's out there. Obviously, now a hot name. Um, there's Jason Kidd, the assistant coach off of the Lakers, but it's like. Who do you go out there that could take this team to the next level? And what moves do you need to make to go back to the Eastern Conference Finals? Because Brad Stevens was in the Eastern Conference Finals a couple of times these past mm -hmm. couple of years. So it's like it, he wasn't a bust. Up. Just can get over the hump. I think that one of the perplexing things for me um, on top of the, uh, the Brad Stevens thing is, I mean, dude just got signed to like an extension, I think, last year and then a month ago it was rumored he was going to get 10 million dollars a year over seven mm -hmm. to go coach the indiana hoosiers and i mean like if we're at this point now i'd be hard pressed not to think that he wouldn't be coaching indiana right now making buku bucks going back to the college world and back home to indiana um so that's another really weird wrinkle for me but you're right i mean you've got to run it in terms of their their vacancy it is what it is they have a vacancy now. Um, it's one of the most uh, like pressured spots to hold as a coach in this league is being, uh, I mean, you've got the Lakers and Celtics. I mean, since the beginning of time, those are two sought after jobs. Where you go from there, again, it's always usually take your top three successive teams in, in the East and West over the last four or five years and find me a killer assistant basically that nobody's heard of who's implemented systems and kind of been doing the work behind the scenes. Or it's the, if it were a lesser team than the Celtics, then you do the recycled coach approach, right? You do the, Hey, um, like Steve Clifford's now out in or Orlando this week in the last couple of days, like, Ooh, let's grab Steve Clifford. Not to say Steve Clifford is might not be a bad option. I mean, that's a dude who's a really defensive mindset and anything about the Boston Celtics, you know, they're, defensive minded team. And Steve's known for that. Um, but the other side, the third thing is, you know, looking at the, the college ranks and is this something where, um, you know, again, as you've seen 
you know, Mike Krzyzewski now, um, the opening, he retire and, you know, they've been kind of promoting within Roy Williams replacement was promoted within, um, you know, some of these big places, is this where somebody, you know, they Boston goes and gets another college guy to kind of come up, uh, you know, like a, a Tom Izzo to come up for a couple of years or something like that, or, um, you know, former NBA player, uh, you know, Kevin Ollie, um, always been thrown around the last couple of years on in, uh, in, in, uh, coaching vacancies. So, I think it's, I think it's likely they find, you know, an assistant on, you know, like the, the Miami heat or, or something like that, or don't throw out something crazy. Like, although I'm going to, I'm not even going to say that Mike D'Antoni's too old, but I'm like, Ooh, I mean, maybe, maybe there's something there. He isn't, he got Steve, Steve along with the nets for a little bit. And I bring him on, but dude's like 70. There's, there's no way we did this with uh, John B line in Cleveland and it, it didn't work out. Couldn't keep up with the schedule and everything else. So. I think that's, I think that's, that's all but so, but it'll be, in my opinion, it'll be an assistant from a, a premier team, maybe somebody on a Monty Williams or something with Phoenix or, you know, something like along those lines. But again, nonetheless, shocking doesn't make it any less shocking just to see that this is kind of where the Celtics are at right now. And um, as a Cleveland Cavaliers fan, I'm like, maybe this is the opportunity to sneak in and try to grab some grab overpay to an extent, something that maybe they wouldn't normally consider. Like, Like here's, I texted our buddy Jeremy Young the other day. I said, all right, my hot take of the day. Colin Sexton and our first round pick, if it's a top three, it'd be even better if it was number one overall. And yeah, a couple other assets here and there for Jalen Brown. You get a 20 plus per game score in Colin Sexton and finally finally a ball handling guard that's going to stay on the court as opposed to Kemba. Um, you get some, some lottery cachet to do somewhat of a rebuild or, or bundle into something else. Um, and I mean, as good of friends, Jackie McMullen said it on, on a podcast this week, famous uh, Boston Globe writer and with ESPN and stuff too, of like, Hey, Jason Tatum and, and Jalen Brown are really good friends. But like when you watch them on the court, they don't complement each other. Well, like, as you'd expect for two dynamic wings, you know, the ball stops a lot. They're not, they're definitely not a Kyrie Kevin combo by any means. They're not a Paul George Kawhi Leonard combo by any means. So I don't know, maybe I'm trying, I'm trying to make, trying to dive in and like be the, the guy picking up the girl that just got dumped and like, Hey, like come over this way. Yeah. I'll take it. I'll take you, Mr. Brown. We, We could use you in Cleveland. We'll have to wait and see what they do. There is another NBA coach who is in the college ranks right now who have heard his name get thrown around. And that's Jawan Howard. I don't think he's going to yeah. leave Michigan, but that is also a person who has a lot of NBA pedigree as well. So, but I don't think he'd leave Michigan, but then again, money talks. Um, <laughs> last series of the first round in the East, the Philadelphia 76ers over the Washington Wizards. We also said the max this would go is five and it exactly went five games on that and i'm gonna tell you right now man joel and b he he was really he was impressive tobias harris was impressive seth curry danny like that was the type of performance i was like philadelphia if they made it to the east of Final, they could challenge the net like i i was impressed by philly and washington I didn't think they'd even be here. I thought they'd be out of the plane. So that was a bad fault on me. But I just feel like they don't, they're not, they don't have any depth. There's Beal, Westbrook, and there's Robin, but that's, that was their problem. They only have two people. What'd you think about this series and what you saw from Philly and Washington? Yeah. I mean, there's like, again, there's like four pieces I really like on. Uh, on Washington, you've got Beal, you got Westbrook again. Um, Daniel Gafford, uh, the who they got from uh, from uh, Chicago, he had 11, 11.8 and five point eight uh, rebounds uh, in the series. I love what Ish Smith brings to the table. Veteran Ish Smith comes in, pushes the pace, and you'll just come in and you're like, all right, back of point guards. And as soon as you know, all like five ten blown by it, and he's got a layup. Like it's it's phenomenal what he brings to the table. Like I. As a team, like again, going back to my Cavs, it didn't even have a point guard, a backup point guard, all like basically all gear. Um, that's a guy I'd love to come in to lead a second unit. So I mean, you're right, just not enough firepower. 
anytime your bench is, I mean, again, just young guys, but anytime you're like benches, Anthony Gill, Garrison, Matthews, Cassius Winston, Chandler Hutchinson, uh, Robin Lopez, like that's, you ain't going to win much with that. Um, I, I win again, you always are one Martin to say, you know, I appreciate, I appreciate the fight and, and the hustle and stuff and not laying down and, you know, Washington did get a game here, but again, just way too much for Philly. And what I loved about Philly was, you know, Embiid missed a game and he's got that, that tear or a couple of small tears in his meniscus. That he's going to have to play through. Um, and he did play game one of, uh, um, the second round last night or yesterday, but, um, Tobias Harris was, was huge. Like that's to me, I mean, that's the Philadelphia 76ers success model, right? Is when you've got Curry and Harris going off. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a team you can talk me into. That's a team that can, that I think could take, you know, two games, maybe, maybe three games from Brooklyn, something like that in the right setting. But uh, Tobias Harris was the MVP of that series, hands down. Just, I mean, guy was guy was efficient in the mid-range game and attacking the basket. Um, just phenomenal all the way around. No, agreed, agreed. I guess with Washington, too, I feel like this is the same holding pattern with Mr. Bradley Beal, because where do they go from here? Do they finally trade Bradley for some assets? That's always been talked about every offseason. Or do they feel like they have enough with Beal and Westbrook to get pieces around them to make a run in the East? Like, what would you do if you were Washington? Would you get rid of Beal or try and build around those two? It's tough because I don't know. I don't know that you can get rid of one without getting rid of the other. Because once you once you devalue kind of the win now mode with Beal and Westbrook, you know, you lose you lose cachet with the other. If you get rid of one, like the other one. The other one ain't having West Russell Westbrook on a roster with a bunch of like 19, 20 year olds ain't going to do anything. I mean, we kind of had that a little bit in, you know, in, in Oklahoma city to an extent um, before the, um, the Chris Paul swap. But again, I think you got, you almost got to do it in tandem, which you might, but um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, what their cap situation looks like. Obviously they're paying a jillion dollars to both those two guys. Um, you know, they got Denny Avia. Um, the Israeli uh, in the draft this past year who was injured for the rest of the season. I mean, he's he's going to grow. I love the way that young man sees the floor um, as kind of a combo uh, forward who can who can fill it up and um, not anywhere Luka Doncic by any means, but he's a guy who can you know shift speeds and and kind of kind of catch you off on the wrong foot and score on you kind of thing. So I mean, it's he's very tactful in that that idea, but. I mean, short of them getting a big signing, I'm always a fan of peel the bandaid off now. You know what I mean? Like they can, and I don't think that's going to, I don't think they're going to do that. I mean, at the end of the day, fan bases, that's why fan bases hold on and overvalue their own players too long is they want to win games and want to put butts in seats. Um, they want to make sure they're still making money, those kinds of things. And obviously it's not going to be a fun time when you move on from Westbrook and Beal. Um, it's just, it's just not, but Again, I'm I'm not a fan of dragging things on um, any longer than I than I have to. So I I I'd, I'd entertain finally finding a home for for Bradley Beal, and it could be. I mean, the the team I keep looking at, it could well be the Golden State Warriors. Uh, yeah, especially they, they get the Timberwolves pick this year. They've got Wiseman. Um, you can package some some expirings and maybe a future first um, using the Steepian rule. Can't be back to back years. Yes, yeah, so Wiggins. <laughs> yeah, Wiggins. I mean, you can do a package of you can do a package of of Wiggins and Eric Pascal. Eric Pascal would be great. Um, uh, add on, uh, you know, Wiseman is a is a good foundation center. To, um, you know, and along with the T Wolves pick, I mean, I think that's your. I think you pull the trigger, man. If I'm Washington, if I can get two firsts out of it and I can get I can get Wiggins to still, you know, be somewhat competitive um, to an extent, again, not the floor, but and then I get Wiseman out of it too. Send it into the league right now. Good. That's a good one on you. That's a good one on you. So with the East now semifinals, we got Brooklyn versus Milwaukee and Philly versus Atlanta. Before we do go out west, let's just yeah, let's finish up because we've already played one. We've already played two two games in. Yeah, we've already played a game game a piece in a couple of these. But let's 
let's look at that. Um, the both both East ones real quick. Who we see winning, um, and just recap of those games. Let's look at the. Let's stay with the, the Sixers. Sixers down one to nothing over the Hawk, uh, or down one to nothing to the Atlanta Hawks. Um, Joel and me did play in that game. They came back close. I turned it off yesterday when I got that text from you, and they're like, "Man, I like to see this fight and everything else." Because I mean, they were up. They were just dogging them. Atlanta was they're almost dogging down, them. They're almost down thirty. Yeah. They were almost I mean, down and thirty, they, and they lost the game by four. So that. That makes me feel a little bit better about it. I mean, it was more the same for Atlanta, you know, what what went on. I mean, Trey had 35 and 10 yesterday. Um, it was more the same than what they did to the Knicks. I mean, they just they just caught fire and were in fuego, man. They just there's there's nothing Philly Philly can do. I mean, Embiid had heck of a game, 39 points, nine rebounds, four assists on basically one good meniscus. Um, but I mean, it this one, I don't overact because we've overacted before in the last series, but this is one. I feel safe is going to go at least six. Yeah, definitely going to go six now since they have um, Atlanta got that win in um, Philadelphia and Embiid, man, like he was falling and the fact that they did come back. But Ben, Ben Simmons, I felt like he did not have one of his best games per se. And I feel like with Embiid um, compromised, he's hobbled that Ben's going to really have to step it up and he's going to really because I personally if I had a vote I actually would have voted in defense player of the year but he's going to really need to like hone in on Trey and be that superstar says I'm guarding him I'm going to lock him down etc cetera, etc cetera. and game 2 game 2 would be Tuesday cuz they played on Sunday if I'm is he going to be Tuesday or Wednesday but Philly's got to win game 2 like I I don't I don't I'm gonna go Philly in six, but I don't like the. Ch- I don't like being down 0-2. That's then you got to win four straight, and then you don't know which game Embiid just doesn't play. So I, I think they gotta win game two and get home court back in like game three in Atlanta. I'm gonna go out on a limb, and I'm, I'm gonna say the Hawks are gonna win this series. I don't think that's out on a limb, man. I really. I don't. think that's on a limb because I mean, there's more for sure. If I know that Embiid's going to play the entire series, mm-hmm. I don't know that he's going to play the entire series. And if he doesn't play, I think you're going to see a lot more of the same yesterday. And between the two, I can't believe I'm saying this again. And it's just what we talked about with Nate McMillan and everything else. The Hawks are a better defensive team, man. I just, that, I mean, they struggle. The Seth Currys of the world and Tobias Harris and Danny Green and what's left of Danny Green, like they're struggling to get out on those Atlanta shooters. Um, there's teams that that's not a problem with like Brooklyn's not Brooklyn and Milwaukee will have zero problem with defending those guys and putting a lid on it. Um, you know, if they were to advance, but I think I'm going to go, I'm going to go Atlanta here in six. I think I want to see, I mean, again, personally, I, I'd love to see Philadelphia really take a, those next steps with, um, and get back to the Eastern Conference Finals for what the second time in three years because they lost to um, they lost in that game seven Kawhi buzzer beater right yep um, but that might have been, I can't remember that might have been second round instead of a third round um, series but anyway um, I I'd love to see Philadelphia win but I think there's I think there's a lot of a lot of question marks and I mean Atlanta's just got gunslingers all over the place and the fact they're playing such good defense. And Joel Embiid's got one meniscus. I mean, dude just dropped 40 and like whatever, 40 and 10 essentially yesterday on one meniscus. But, and I don't want to overreact to one game, but man. No. I will go Philly. I'll go Philly and six. And just because Embiid is hurt, I don't know, man. Because if they lose this one, where I really think they can make the Eastern Conference Finals, we really might have to revisit that. Should we break up the Embiid and Simmons thing? You really might have to revisit that because I before James Harden got traded to the Nets, I really felt like fully healthy. This could be Philly's year, but if they get upset by Atlanta, man, they really need to like evaluate what they have, and they might need to start doing some moves as well. But I think the headlining series in the East Semis is obviously Brooklyn versus Milwaukee, and Brooklyn won Game One, one fifteen to one hundred seven. The game really wasn't that close as a score like when i watched that entire game it was not that close 
Also, James Harden went out the first game of game one. Uh, he is already, they've already said he's not playing game two. So, Evan, what are you thinking about this one? Like, can Brooklyn beat Milwaukee without James Harden? Yes. Yes, they can. Um, yeah, this one wasn't particularly close. Um, you know, I think, I mean, Giannis had 34 in the opener, but um, again, I mean, just Brooklyn's got so much firepower. Like, this one, this one ain't going to be a sweep. It's probably not going to be a gentleman's sweep. But I think Brooklyn takes this in six games, max. It doesn't go. I don't. I don't think it goes seven. I do. I mean, I think they take it unless something catastrophic happens with Kyrie or Kevin Durant. Um, you know, I think. I think Milwaukee's going to be competitive. I think all these games are going to be somewhat close. Um, but man, just I mean, Brooklyn just got so much fire. I mean, Blake had eighteen. Just popping, he hit four threes the other uh, the other day. You know, Kyrie wasn't all that efficient, but I mean, still got his own twenty five. And um, he and Durant were almost identical: twelve for twenty five for one, eleven for twenty six from the other. Um, man, I want I want Milwaukee to succeed. I really, really do. Um, this is just a buzzsaw, and this is you know again for as good as the Cavs were in twenty eighteen. It was a buzzsaw with Golden State and Kevin Durant. There's just nothing you could do about it. I mean, stacked up against any year, that Cavs 2018 team was better than the title year. It, they were, um, I mean, they were just phenomenal. I mean, they set all kinds of offensive records in the playoffs, you name it. Um, Three-pointers made, um, offensive efficiency, points per game, you name it. Um, just sometimes there's a buzzsaw in front of you. It doesn't mean your team's bad. It doesn't mean... Your your team sucks. It just means your team doesn't have Kevin Durant. Like it's just it, you got to look at it's same kind of concept in the '90s, but like times ten because all these guys are on the same team who can ISO score like this. Um, you know those Cavs teams that went against the Bulls in the early '90s with Craig Elo and Mark Price and um, and uh, La uh, Larry Nance Senior and and Brad Doherty. Uh, those those were some freaking good teams, man. They just ran into a buzzsaw called the Chicago Bulls. I mean, <laughs> it's tough. I, I'm not saying we're there yet. It's only really year one of this big three in Brooklyn, but I mean, they're just firing all cylinders. I don't, I don't think, I don't think they need James Harden to, to, to dispatch this team. And I mean, heck I, Mike James who bounced around a lot, that dude went all out the other day, 12 points, seven boards, uh, six is, or three assists. I mean, journeyman kind of uh, G leaguer and just came in and, and poured it into love what I'm seeing out of Nick Claxton too, with some quality minutes off the bench. I like Brooklyn. Yeah. I like Brooklyn as well. I think, I think I'm going to go Brooklyn in six two. I almost, with James being down, I almost wanted to say Brooklyn in seven, just because of the way I saw the Bucks play against the heat. But seeing Blake Griffin play in game one, I thought I was watching like Clippers Blake Griffin. Because obviously the Blake Griffin in Detroit was not playing like he is playing now. So I thought I had, I thought I was blind because I was like, is that really the same Blake Griffin who came from Detroit, couldn't dunk anymore, what, et cetera, et cetera. And like when those players are fighting like that, and also I always like to shout them out when we talk about Brooklyn freaking Joe Harris, who's just a freaking sniper, like offensively knowing they can't be stopped, but we'll see how it goes with James Harden and Giannis. And I hope, I hope they make this competitive. I don't think Milwaukee is going to go down without a fight. So currently then your Eastern conference finals would be Brooklyn versus Atlanta. And mine would be Brooklyn versus Philadelphia. If the picks hold true on the East coast. Anything else on the East Coast before we uh, shift out West? I know there's there's some people who are waiting to hear some of our West Coast. Yeah, let's swing. Let's swing West. Um, let's start with the series of the playoffs um, in terms of news, in terms of can't believe that happened, but can believe that happened. Um, that is Phoenix and Los Angeles Lakers. Phoenix dispatched LA four games to two. 
um, in the two wins for um, the Lakers here. Um, let's see. They won 109, 102 in game two. Then they won again. Um, they were up 2 1 in the series, then uh, proceeded to lose uh, the next, um, yeah, the next uh, three games. So, um, again, Anthony Davis hobbled at the end, didn't have much, didn't have much out of him. Uh, LeBron still dealing with the ankle thing. I'm not making excuses for him by any means. Um, still dealing with the high ankle sprain that really kind of kept him out for the most and he's missed in any year whatsoever. Um, that was clearly bothersome, but, um, you know, I did worry about, you know, I don't, on the onset, you know, getting Schroeder and Marcus all in the off season, we all thought, man, just reload kind of thing. Like they still don't have enough bench scoring. They still don't have enough consistency in terms of, um, I mean, just in terms of, you know, putting the ball in the basket, like outside of LeBron and, and Davis. I mean, KCP will put it in those kinds of things. Kuzma is just abysmal. Um, like, they've got to somehow hope that they can talk a third big star into signing with them. I mean, all these guys are on with the exception of like Kuzma on relatively short deals that they could dump somewhere with a pick or something like that to clear cap space in hopes that, you know, a big name opts out. There's not a lot of big names on the market, um, you know, coming in next year, but I, I mean, they, they just had no answer for Phoenix and Devin Booker and Chris Paul just continue what they've been doing all season. They were the number two seed for a reason. Um, you saw contributions all the way around from, uh, you know, Jay Crowder from, um, uh, Bridges, you name it. I mean, they, they thoroughly earned this series and they, they knocked out the defending champs. One way back when, uh, before the season started, you and I both said that watch out for Phoenix. We said this before the season started. We said they're going to get in the playoffs and they could potentially go to the Western Conference Finals. We said that even before them playing a game. Um, when we previewed this thing and we were like full guns, AD, LeBron, we didn't even, we also said if we both picked the Lakers in like six, potentially it could go seven. We knew Phoenix was not going to be a tough out regardless because they are super talented so when ad went down and when also when phoenix won game one i'm like okay this is going to be a pretty long series and when ad went down la stood no chance because the two games that la won anthony davis was the leading scorer with 34 both games and then when he went down they they had no chance so i do so giving us props because we caught out phoenix before anyone else and we also said this was going to be tough. I don't know why people thought that Lakers were going to win in five. I was not seeing that at all. And our, our last preview, as we talked about, if you don't, if you're not a basketball junkie and you don't get to see Trey Young in the East, a lot of people did not know how good Devin Booker was now until seeing him on the national stage. Like this guy is one of like the best bright, like young basketball players we have in our league right now. And Chris Paul, man, everywhere he goes, that team just improves to another level. It's ridiculous. And we talked about injuries. Chris Paul was hobbled up, too. So, like, he had, like, the shoulder injury. I don't know if AD was fully healthy and Chris Paul was fully healthy. I think we both picked the Lakers. I think the Lakers actually pull it out. But Chris was also hurt, too. And, man, also DeAndre Ayton played well. Like, this Phoenix team really shocked the world Mm -hmm. if you weren't paying attention them throughout the season but i don't think it was that shocking to you and i no i mean we we saw this when this team was this team was assembled and they got chris paul and that's just what chris paul does chris paul's like adding the rock to you know a franchise like you're gonna get a boost because of it yeah. um what a, what a leader um just do just scrappy player is his mid-range game even to his in his age right now is still on point the weight i mean he's they joke with him being like they call him the point god for a reason. I mean, guy just can can distribute the basketball. I'm just admit, like too like and even his backup Cameron Payne was like out of the league, man. Like he was like a third point guard for us on a rebuilding team like two years ago. And we're like done. This guy comes in and like 
he's blown by LeBron with that high ankle sprain and his age, whatever the combo is, like there's no answer. He turned the corner on LeBron. He's at the hoop, just 90 miles an hour. I mean, you're right. Um, I, I want to shout Monty Williams again, well-deserved, you know, first time. Um, I mean, obviously he coached some of those Pelicans teams with, um, with Anthony Davis. Uh, obviously now he's on the other side of this series and, and has his first playoff series win. he's been impeccable and getting his team to mesh and shout out to very, very, um, recent GM champ, James Jones who's assembled this squad and, and pulled off the, the, you know, the Chris Paul deal um, and, and has stayed the course to try to keep Devin Booker happy and not dwindling at the bottom of the West. And this is a formidable team. I mean, I, I have some questions about their, um, t- their depth to an extent, but as long as Chris Paul and, and Devin Booker there, I think they're going to give, you know, Denver a hard, hard, hard series, man, a hard series. So we talked about uh, the Clippers previous night. The last podcast, we talked about who won the Clippers to confidently get you 12. We talked about that also in Boston. I think we should have brought that up with the Lakers because if you look outside of LeBron and Anthony, Dennis Schroeder, who it looks like he did average 14, but he had that goose egg in game five when they lost by, when they lost by 30, I was like, this series is over. But besides Dennis, who was, I don't want to know if I can consistently count on him getting 12. You look at the rest of that roster, there's no one else you can consistently think to get you 12 points. They're paying too much to Kuzma, Andre Drummond. People finally saw just how bad he was and how bad he is. I mean, I saw that in, in Cleveland. I mean, just he was good with us to start the year. Then when everybody got settled in during the bubble, I think that was more advantage of, hey, just a big dude who can get buckets underneath. And they kind of got him figured out. And then he wasn't even getting buckets underneath anymore. He's not jumping as much as he is anymore. He's still gobbling up boards. But, I mean, he's bad. I mean, again, we're talking about Andre Drummond who can't even get you 12 points or 10 points. I mean, it's, it's bad. But, I mean, Matthews, Macklemore, um, they benched Trez this entire series, basically. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I, I want to say, in general, he's probably good for their team. I mean, he played 12 garbage minutes in the end and, and scored on three of the four um, or three of the five baskets he had and got to the line four times. I don't, I don't know what happened either. That's, I mean, that's your sixth man of the year last year. I don't, I don't, I don't know how you just don't play him, but you're right. I mean, they're going to have to, and look at the free agent list. There's not a lot of folks out there who are like, Holy crap, that's going to add something to this Laker team. Like it's going to have to be LeBron recruiting behind the scenes, to try to get somebody to opt out a year early, that kind of thing. And, you know, I, again, I don't think we're – if the Clippers get bounced in this next round, I mean, some of, one of those two dudes, I think, I think Kawhi can opt out. Yeah. Um, like, I still think that's a possibility if they don't advance past the series. Like, that's, that's the Lakers – that's like the Lakers' only hope, I'll be honest, is, is getting somebody like that. Because I just don't know where else they're going to get some consistent score. I mean, again, they – paid way too much to Kyle Kuzma that looked like a good deal at the time. Um, but I mean, just patching in with all these buyout guys and, and into the bench guys like Macklemore and Matthews that don't have it anymore. Like there's just, what do you do with that? I think a lot of people are going to be KCP had zero points in 15 minutes. <laughs> like what do you do with that? Yeah, the mantra's Markeith Morris isn't the better of the Morris twins. What do you do with that? Really, I'm trying to look. I think when you can guarantee the CD, is Dennis? Was that? Is Dennis still going to be? Uh, he has not. He's got a deal he needs to sign. He claims he's coming back, but that's potential money that they don't have allocated yet. They haven't been able to work a deal yet. I, I don't envy Rob Polinka, and the long and short of it is I don't envy Rob Polinka and trying to get more than one title out of this LeBron tenure at, at, with the Lakers. I mean, because and, and that's kind of what comes with LeBron, right? Is I mean, you've got to overextend and get out all the assets to you know get a guy or so. And we saw it in Cleveland too. Of like at a certain point, you're out of room and you're out of you're out of picks. Like there's only so much you can do. So, but. 
that's for another day. We'll get into some of that in the off season. Let's um, let's switch over to the series just finished yesterday in a in a game seven. I told you I wasn't thrilled about calling this, but I did say clips in seven, and it was clips in seven. Um, you know when when they needed them to show up and it started back. I mean, doubt that was a winnable game for Dallas in game six. They lost by seven, um, 104 97 in game six. Um, and the cl- first of, uh, first of the closeout games opportunities. Um, and then they just got dubbed hard yesterday. I mean, Kawhi mainly in that game six, Kawhi Leonard just went off. Um, and again, he had like 70 some points between the two games. He was the reason by and large, they won a lot yesterday. Um, they just, along with, um, Terrence Mann, who had, I mean, a guy that Ty Lue just rolled out there and said, young, young pup, I'm going to give you some minutes in a game seven, um, kudos to Ty for, for stepping up and winning that game. I mean, I don't want to call him big game Ty yet, but I mean, he does have a, a, a pretty much a pretty nice game seven, uh, thing so far. You go back to that Boston series against Jason Tatum and um, and LeBron. And then obviously 2016, we all know what happens. Um, again, it helps having LeBron and Kawhi Leonard on your, on your roster. Don't get me wrong. That helps. That helps a lot. He's been blessed, but, um, the Clippers did pull it out and they've at least extended potentially, you know, a, a breakup of the team to another series. So Martin thoughts on this series, Luca went, Luca went off. I mean, he's just such a joy to watch, man. I mean, I, we were talking today about Porzingis being unhappy and feels like he's second fiddle as opposed to a co-star like that dude just needs to get a reality check um because this guy this guy's phenomenal and he's not you are nowhere near in his atmosphere you might be a good player chris stops porzingis but you are not luka Doncic. you are not 75 percent of luka Doncic. yeah and for the people who um remember the nick when the unit on the mount well as everyone who's listened to the L7C podcast, um, NBA ones, and if anyone in our um, messages knows, I am not high on the Clippers at all. I picked the Clippers to lose on this podcast last uh, recording in six games. When they were down 0-2, I thought they were getting swept. I'm not going to lie. I just, I can never forgive them from last year, but... I was wrong. There was a point in game six when I was sitting there and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be right. And Kawhi Leonard said, I'm going to ball out for Mr. Evan Debo so that he could be right. And gave Evan 45 and one of the great playoff performances we've seen in recent memory. And they pulled it off in seven games. Uh, This is also the first series in NBA history where the road team won the first six games. Definitely wanted to note that out, but I think what I saw is what we were hyped about, I think would have been two years, a year and a half ago, whenever the signing happened with Kawhi and Paul George to the clip. Like what I saw in game seven is like, that's what we wanted to see from this team to challenge the Lakers in the West finals. And obviously we won't get this time because the Lakers are already at home, but there were players who stepped up from the Clippers who I did not expect. You already um, you hit on Terrence Mann. He stepped up. Uh, another one who made shots in Game 7 was Luke Bernard. Like, he made shots, and he has not been – he was not good in Detroit. But he made some shots. Reggie Jackson stepped up. And you want to talk about – we say who could get you 12 consistently. And you saw Kawhi average 32 in this. Paul George – The pride of – back to – Back to Luke Kennard, the pride of Middletown, Ohio, Luke Kennard. That is, that is true. But Paul got you 23. Reggie Jackson got you 15. Mark Moore got you 11. Nicholas Kuhn got 9.3. And then see the others, but it, it's, it's good on them. I felt they did. They were the better team in the end. But with the Mavericks, it really did remind me, maybe just because we've been we live in Ohio and we watch maybe one billion Cavaliers games. It reminded me of I don't know which particular year, but it obviously reminded me of those old LeBron James teams where it's just like you just don't have the firepower. It'd probably be the year before they beat the Pistons for the first time, um, where they were taking those Pistons with Chauncey Billups and them to like seven games and then get blown out in the seventh game. But 
Luka Doncic showed that he showed why we picked him to be one of the top two MVP candidates before the season started. The dude was just out of this world. And I think my biggest thing with Luka is that he would score a lot in the first half, but then like the second half, it was just like night and day. And obviously Kawhi started guarding him, which now we have the talks of why people said Kawhi was potentially the best player in the NBA or the best two-way player. But for me, good on the Clippers. I still don't believe in them. I'm not picking them. I'm already going to say it right now. I'm not picking them to win the next series. Just they got to keep showing me before I pick them. But I, mean I think Luca. I think the Mavericks, Evan, when we go to the offseason, is going to be a team we talk about a lot. Because what do you do to build around him? I mean, Tim Hardaway, he played. He had 17, but he wasn't making shots in game seven. And Kristoff, he is a shell of his former self. And it's like, who do you go out to help them? And I think that's going to be a team we talk about a lot in the offseason. But Clippers, for everyone listening, I eat crow. Prove me wrong. We'll see what you do next round. They proved you wrong temporarily. 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 The explosion show. I had notes ready for the explosion show on the Clippers. I had the timeline of when everyone got signed, everything. But Well, just pull, file that away maybe for like another week and a half. We might be coming back to this. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Oh man, but that was a very entertaining. They 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 proved us wrong for a, for a week and a half or so. So Trailblazers. So so Denver Denver dispatched Portland again, struggling to make it too far in the playoffs. Um, in six games, um, they take the final game one twenty six one fifteen. Uh, Lillard just phenomenal throughout the entire series, but alas, coming up short again. Um. Martin, what did you see in this series? I, obviously, you know, with with Denver, it's it's the Jokic conversation. It's the emergence of Michael Porter Jr. Um, you know, again, they don't have Jamal Murray right now, but Austin Rivers stepped up huge. Um, and again, that dude was like out of the league for like a couple months. Nobody like jumped on signing him for some reason when when the Knicks bought him out. Um, what what did you see? Uh, you know, obviously Denver went to the West Finals last year. What did you see from Denver? What did you see from Portland? Um, just thoughts on the series. Well, another thing, to, if you have, counting us out again, we said if Jamal Murray wasn't hurt, we we thought about picking this team to go to the final, like even with the Lakers, because they are, they're stacked. But I want to start with Portland, though. And it's, if you've watched, these two have actually met in the playoffs a couple of times. If you remember Portland's run to the Western Conference Finals, they upset um, – what are their names? Denver Nuggets back then in 2019. That was before the bubble. But I'm just looking at these stats, man. Like Dame averaged 34. I didn't even know CJ averaged 20. It didn't feel like it. Norman Powell averaged 17. Uh, Nurkic averaged 13. I felt like he needed to be more aggressive, especially going against the Joker. I felt like that was one of the things. Our guy Mello averaged 12. So you had five guys average double figures. And then Robert Coverton was at 9.3. I just felt like that's a defensive problem. It's the same mode. They they can't play a lick of defense. I mean, all these teams we've talked about to this point of man, they'd kill to have a guy who can who can go out and get them freaking eleven or twelve points a game, like reliably. By all means, they've got it in Portland. They just they are disinterested in playing defense, whatever reason the the scheme didn't work, and ultimately, right at the end of the series, just as what happened with Boston, um, Terry Stotts is now out as the head coach in Portland. Um, and I, I really, really like Terry Stotts, um, his his offense and everything else. I mean, so, I mean, that could be a guy. I wouldn't be surprised if Terry Stotts is a guy who could end up with that Boston job, just um, how he handles superstars and stuff like that. But, um, again, they just can't play defense and and – um, Denver burned them this series. Every game was high scoring. It was game six. Was it? Yeah, it was either six or five. Where I texted you and I was like, Michael Porter Jr. This is why no back injury. He was the number one pick in high school. He was going to be the number one pick in the NBA draft. And the fact that Denver has him. And he is showing what he can do. So, and they don't even have Jamal Murray. Like, 
And I know it aggravates me. And I know it aggravates you because he could have been in the state of Ohio. But goodness gracious, this dude is a freaking baller and he's getting better and better. And the MVP of the league, joke, I mean, Joker, man, I wish Jamal Murray was on the team playing right now because this team could win it all. I, I'm going to say it. I, I think they could. Am I crazy? Am I crazy to say, though, that like, I mean, Murray's been inconsistent all year, even when he was playing, that like, if that was the standard, if we take Murray this year, are they missing a whole lot with what they're getting out of Austin Rivers right now? That is true. I'm just, it I'm hurts. Just Don't get me wrong, off. but that just shows you how much Rivers has stepped up. And on the playmaking side, how much Jokic has stepped up. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think, I mean, they're, I think they're going to, I mean, I think they're absolutely going to um, likely beat Phoenix, but, you know, I think that one's going to go six or seven. Um, I don't want to keep calling, copping out and saying it's going to be six or seven for all these series, but like, I just, I mean, they don't have eight. I mean, who you've got eight, but who's going to contend with, with Jokic, man. I mean, too, I mean, that game five you mentioned where as good as Porter was, um, you know, defensively, too, to shut down everybody else other than Lillard with a playoff high of 55 that game and that overtime loss. At the end of regulation, I mean. Double overtime, yeah. Double overtime. I just, I yeah, Portland's got to learn to play defense. Um, They've got a Norman Powell's a free agent. So is Gary Trent that they just gave up for. Um, so that's going to be a huge spot to try to get him re-signed. I mean, I think I like the Norman Powell fit out there. Um, I think, I mean, they've got it. There's some wiggle room. You can move around some stuff. They definitely overpaid for Covington. Um, I think they got to move on from Nurkic. Um, yeah, I, they've got, they got to continue to tweak the roster here and there. And who knows? I mean, maybe Lillard will finally say enough's enough. I need out. Um, and then you're looking at trying to move him to um, trying to move him somewhere, you know, where there's another super, swap him for another superstar that's disgruntled or wants out, or, you know, there's maybe another blockbuster deal to be had somewhere. So who knows, but nonetheless, um, you know, Denver again, who we've, we've had going far it advances. Um, I feel bad for that trailblazer rip city fan base. It just every year, it feels like it's a first or second round exit. Um, but uh, nonetheless, they will advance to play the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, we, we've we watched teams where we know their ceiling. Like, I really felt like 2019, that was the ceiling for Portland, making that Western Conference Finals. I really feel like that is the highest they'll go. Like, I don't think they'll win a title with the team currently. With McCollum and Lillard, they will not. And I've seen... I've seen rumors and stuff about talking about like Carl Anthony Towns to um, Portland, which he's a good player. I don't know how much that would help them. But when you talked about Dane saying enough, potentially, he hasn't said anything like that. Potentially saying enough's enough and him going with another superstar. I'm going to throw this out because we mentioned them earlier. What about a swap with Jalen Brown for Dame? And have Dame go to Boston would be teared up with Jason Tatum, and you send Kimba with them as well. How do you think about that? That could be a potential thing. I don't know that it'll be only if he puts a gun to their head do they trade him. They're more likely to do McCollum for Brown. Um, but that's the beauty of the NBA, right? Is because there's so many there's so many teams that I feel like are in that situation where like they're not going to win as a group. Um, they're not going to win as a tandem. Like Portland's one of those teams. Washington's one of those teams. Um, Dallas now with Porzingis, like somewhere in there, you can have some musical hats of some players just to see if the, if the fits better. Um, you know, I could see, and then you got some, some interesting third party teams that have some talent um, potentially that they could ship somewhere else. Like I could see Kevin Love always been rumored to get to Portland. Obviously that's an absurd contract. It's likely not going to happen while he's still under this contract. But, um, but yeah, whether it's like a McCollum, McCollum, Beal, Wiggins, Porzingis, like somewhere in there's a couple trades to just shuffle the hats a little bit, put the shells over top of the um, over the ball, at like and 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 shuffle them around like at a baseball game, see on the jumbotron, and just see what see what comes up and fits where. Like I think I think there's definitely room there for. 
um, for a move there. And I, I, I'm with you. I don't, I don't know that, I mean, at a certain point you got to look hard and say, this sucks to do, but McCollum and Lillard just, we've done everything we can around those two. Like it's just, it's just not going to win in the state. And obviously they want to keep Lillard. They're motivated to keep Lillard as the better of the two. McCollum's a heck of a player, but um, I think there's, I think there's room to, to shift some stuff around here there. So Martin, let's move to the, are we on the last one? Yeah, we're on the last one. One more thing. Number, yeah. I don't see, I don't know why people just, Dan Lillard is not going to the Los Angeles. No, I don't he's know. not. Any mathematical, financial, I don't see any way that happens unless you're trading like Anthony Davis, which you're not doing. So I just want to get that out because I'm tired of seeing the photoshops of Dame in a Lakers jersey with LeBron and AD. Unless you literally are playing three on five, that ain't happening. If he were a free agent or could opt out, that would be the case. But he's under contract, and Lakers have nothing to get this done. So it ain't happening. You're right. It's just people bored with Photoshop and Instagram trying to get clicks. Like That's, that's all it is. I mean, I... Don't get me wrong, that'd be fun. And maybe they're teasing this. I'm not sure when Lillard's contract expires, like if it expired next year, you could opt out a year from now, something like that. Then I see why Jason Kidd was like, yeah, I don't want to be the coach over there, knowing full well that Lillard might be willing to come to Los Angeles, like that you could do something like that. However, um, that ain't in the cards in the next 12 months, in the next 14 months, um, let's put that to bed. So speaking of put to bed, the number one seed in the West in our final first round matchup, Utah Jazz um, put away the scrappy Memphis Grizzlies uh, four to one. Obviously, you know the Grizzlies won the play-in game and they came out and took took game one right off the bat. Um, then it was four straight by Utah. Um, obviously, Donovan Mitchell didn't play in the first game; he played in every game since. Um, and I mean, every game was was not close. It was um, it was almost with the exception of game four um, was was double digits. So John Morant continued, like you said, with some of these other guys. If you haven't seen Booker, if you haven't seen Neil Beal and stuff, you've heard of these guys. You know they're good, but you don't know how good they are until they're performing the playoffs in a playoff series. And I mean, John Morant was phenomenal to the tune of 30 points a game and eight assists. Um, really excited to see that young man continue to grow. He's just so, so young and the sky's the limit. But um, nonetheless, uh, Utah advances. Uh, they will move on to face the embattled L.A. Clippers. Uh, Martin, notes on this series at all? Uh, if Donovan Mitchell would have played game one, this would have been 4-0. Just, I'm just going to stop. Like, we've watched Memphis all year, um, especially at home. They are almost unbeatable as a team at home besides that game one. And the team, man, they got sixth man of the year, uh, Jordan Clarkson, who's, who's made great improvements. And, like, Donovan, Conley, Gobert, Royce O'Neal, Jordan. They have Joe Angus. Like, they have a squad. And I don't want to say too much. I don't want to switch to Memphis. Okay, John Morant with Dylan Brooks. I mean, the sky's the limit, as you said. Like, the dude, what, first playoff series? I don't even know if he's going to be one. Yeah. Yeah. No, he is 21. 21 on the dot. Average thirty points in his first playoff series. They're like Denver. They're like Denver before the. Um, they're like Denver like a year ago, like when they like when or two years ago when like when Porzingis is injured and it's just one dude and a bunch of bunch of scrubs and how far will the one dude take them up with a very young guy? I see a lot of. Um, did I say Denver? I meant Dallas. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Dallas. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's like a Dallas Mavericks situation type thing. They're like a year behind where the the Mavericks are, but I mean. This is the future of the Western Conference. Um, LeBron ain't getting any younger. Uh, Kawhi and those guys, they could be in East for two years from now. I don't know. Um, just the way some of these guys swap teams and stuff. These guys are Luca, Jaw, they are the future of the Western Conference. Um, you know, Donovan's still young too, but man is man is this Utah team impressive. I I am taking them to beat the Los Angeles Clippers in this next series. They're way more fundamentally sound. Um, they've got way more depth. And then what the Clippers just faced in seven. Um, yeah, let's, if that's a good transition point, again, I don't want to belittle the year that Memphis had to get to this point. They're four games above 500, um, 38 and 34. They average 115 in the series. Again, it's just 
one of those things where it's just job by himself. Um, phenomenal year by by them. They'll continue to grow. They'll continue to try to put talent around Jaw, um, and they'll always be defense minded, um, a defensive minded team. But um, moving into the second round, if that's okay with you. Oh yeah. Utah mm-hmm. uh, hosts the Los Angeles Clippers, a one and four seed tomorrow night at ten. I likely will not be up for that, although I might be. Um, we'll see. But it just depends on the day. Um, but uh, I, man, again, I just the the Clippers will need Herculean efforts from Kawhi and Paul George, who hasn't really provided. I mean, he's Paul's been Paul was good when they needed him to be, but um, or George Paul, as you call him in text threads. But uh, again, I just like Utah's depth. I like what they do defensively. Um, Again, just they got so many different ways to fill it up. I'm going to take. I'm going to take Utah in six. I'm going to take. I wouldn't be surprised if it's Utah in five, Martin. I'm feeling jazzy today. Oh, well, I'm picking the Jazz too. Every I'm, I'm picking. I will not pick the Clippers. In the title and the next year I'll pick. But I am taking Utah. I mean, all the issues that they had was guarding Luca, and now you're going to have to come guard Donovan Mitchell. And if you guys don't know, he is only 24. He is coming as well. And as I heard today on the radios and on first take, Donovan Mitchell has a whole team. And I don't want to belittle that Dallas, to me, didn't have any veteran leadership, while the Utah Jazz has veteran leadership in our guy, Mike Conley. Like, I I really believe. I think they're going to beat them. After watching that series, I think the Jazz will beat the Clippers in seven games. And then the explosion, the Clipper episode will happen. And then the explosion of the team will happen. Oh, that is part of the episode. Because that team will get blown up. Blown up. And that's what I was going to bring up to you, too, about Kawhi. I've seen things, if they would have lost that first round, people were potentially thinking about Kawhi going back east and going to Miami. I don't know if they have the money or cap space or whatever for that, but... They'd make it happen. So. I was like, hmm, that was interesting, but yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm taking Jazz too. We'll see if the Clippers can prove me wrong yet again. Now, the other series, though, I'm still trying to think in my brain. I'm torn. I'm torn. You going, Suns? You got Devin Booker, Chris Paul, DeAndre Ayton. You got the Joker, Michael Porter Jr., Austin Rivers. I let me let me let me frame it to you this way. I think if you ask me today, I'm going Denver to win this series. Although I don't feel confident in it. However. Look at Phoenix. Now, granted, two completely different teams. Phoenix plays defense. Look at Phoenix with the two-guard action and look at Portland with the two-guard action. And I'm seeing a lot of comps, and I'm seeing this kind of end in the same result. Now, granted, Phoenix is going to defend. They've got, I mean, DeAndre Ayton is way better than Nurkic. Um, Bridgers is way better defender than whatever the Ole defense is that Carmelo Anthony's doing because he's only interested in, in playing offense. We all know this. Um, but, I mean, Denver's, Denver's depth, um, Denver's length. I mean, I, I think it's going to be probably the most entertaining of the series, um, of any of these series. I think it will be. I mean, we all know Phoenix is going to be a tough out. Um, I just – Again, I, I could swing somewhere else tomorrow. That's how close I feel like these two teams are. But, I mean, as of now, I just, I just see way too many similarities in kind of the construct of that, that two combo guard kind of action that you have in Phoenix to what you have in the Portland set and how easily Denver dispatched them, man. I just, that's kind of where I'm leaning right now. I'm going to go Denver 7. Denver 7. So I got two seven game series out in the West. I hope so. I mean, that's there's we always say there's the two words in game seven. I mean, there's a reason why this is so exciting. There's a reason why it's just it's everything and um and and the sport of basketball is to get to that point. And I hope for fans' perspective that we get there. 
I hope we, I hope we do. It's been a, again a, a really informative first round series. We learned a lot about where teams are, where they're not, um, what they might be doing in the off season, how they have the reset button, who might who might advance coming here into the second and into the third. Like it's just an exciting time to be a basketball fan as we know it. That would give us if it holds true the Nugget and the Jazz in the West Finals, which that would be a very interesting matchup. Uh, there were some tad bit things I forgot to mention when we were recording. Um, obviously, with LeBron and them losing, LeBron 14 and 1 in the first round. That was his first first round. It was his first exit. Just trying to throw that out there, make sure we got that in. But I don't know. Evan, I, I'm liking the NBA playoffs. Like, I've been super into it. And a question I do want to ask you before we do sign off here today, because we both love basketball, but there's been radio stuff about, like, because this is also the first time in the NBA Finals won't have LeBron or Steph Curry. So what do you think that does for, like, casual fans? Because I like that we're going to have a new NBA champion this year. I really do. So, and if it's not Brooklyn and it's not Hawaii, it's going to be a new star emerging themselves to the mainstream. So what do you think about like not having LeBron or Steph in and new faces? People finally get to see these young guns. I mean, I hope we're heading that way. However, um, I think, I think we are going to have, it's highly unlikely we won't have Kawhi on one side. Although we, you and I have both picked against it this series, but let me, that's, that's a bad example. Um, I think it's highly unlikely the Brooklyn Nets are not in there, and that affords just star power. But what you said is valid. I mean, we've had an entire generation of fans. I mean, in the last – from 2000, 2012 to, 2000, um, to 2020, we've had, uh, we've had four LeBron titles. We've had uh, three, three Curry titles, right? Yep, three Curry titles in there. Um, we've also had three Kawhi titles in there, or potentially this would be the third. If he were to come through somehow and pull off a miraculous run, and it's one, and he's capable of that. I don't know. He is capable of that. Um, this would be the third since 2014. Um, you're right. It's it's exciting to know, like we talked about with the different moving around pieces. There's that much talent in the league. Um, there's a lot of parody. It's it's exciting for basketball. It's exciting for a fan. But um, I hope if you're if you're a younger listener, a younger fan of the game, or you know somebody who is that, you know, we're we're talking up the next generation because at a certain point, the LeBrons and the Chris Pauls are going to be done. As much as it seems weird to say that because they're just immortal, it seems at this rate. And the Devin Booker's are going to be here. The Bradley Beals are going to be here for forever. And and we're going to have some great matchups with those guys and continue to see that with Dame Lillard and, and everything else. But you're right. That's a valid, that's a valid point, but I expect Brooklyn to be there and, and we'll get the star power from that. There might magically be all those golden state fans that were Miami heat fans might be Brooklyn Nets fans by the end of this. I won't be one of them, but there are that type of fan out there and I could see it going that way. Brooklyn does win. That would also be from 2020. That would be KD's third. Yes. And Kyrie's second, but it would be James Harden's first, which would be a very, because then if you put an NBA title next to James Harden's resume, you're like, whoa. So it happens when you assemble monster juggernauts like the Brooklyn Nets are, and I don't see, I, I see them steamrolling the East, man. We'll see. I mean, the Bucks are going to have a lot to say about it. I think the Bucks will have a lot more to say about it than the winner of the other series, but this is their toughest test getting to the finals is this series. So we'll see. Anything else that we missed, Evan, before we sign off here? I think that's it. Yeah, we did a lot of covered it all. Covered it all. Evan, do you have any final words before we sign out? Um I just hope I did just my last thing is I hope I hope we get to see a lot out of Joel and B. I hope he's he doesn't tear something further and and we get to see that be a series. Um, dude's just so, so good. I mean, he'll likely be number two or number three in MVP this year. Um, a- again, injuries are going to be an issue when you're that big and you've got that much brute force to throw around on those knees that, you know, it's tough. But um, I just hope we get a healthy Joel Embiid for the series. 
Yeah, my only last thing besides the usual, thank everyone for listening. I like comment on anything you listen to. Um, just want to touch on it a little bit. Fans, calm down. Stop running into the crowd. Stop, I mean, not the crowd, to the arenas on the game. Stop first. it. Stop spitting. Stop throwing water at water bottles. I mean, it's just giving a bad look. I don't want to equate because we haven't, we've been inside because of COVID. That, that's no excuse for bad behavior. And these aren't even like little kids doing this. These are full grown adults doing this. So just be better. That's the only thing I, I ask. We have, as Evan has stated, we have fans in the NBA arenas and it is great for the playoffs. So don't ruin it for us watching at home and your other fandom. So just know how to behave. That's all I have. Stop running on the court, people. It's not that hard. That hard. And with that being said, thank you, everyone, for listening to the L7C podcast. You guys take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the L7C podcast. Be sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the channel. Follow us on all social media platforms, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.